I'm uh, very pleased to be here to speak to an audience uh, here in Ontario. And I noticed there might be a few people in the room older than me. Mm -hmm. Always nice, that doesn't happen very often. And I guess I'm kind of the oldest Canadian professor, at least from the point of view of having started off as the first Canadian professor in Canada. And now there are many universities with Canadian uh, professors that are doing great work. So I started off the month uh, in Brazil for a week, giving talks there. And I went to Los Angeles, I went to Oakland, I went to Palo Alto, I went to Baltimore for a big company, a big uh, meeting. And now I'm here, and I'm very pleased to have a chance to people talk to Canadians who are really interested in, in, in this kind of topic. So you've all, you've all heard how we Canadians have more water, more fresh water per capita than any other country in the world. Now I hear that we probably have a tender pride. Okay, so when, when we hear that we Canadians have more fresh water than any other country in the world, we're usually proud of that. But really, it, it's a problem. Canadians, I think, are of the developed countries, we're probably the most backward of all when it comes to using and protecting our water, and particularly with respect to groundwater. We're particularly backward with respect to groundwater because only 30% of Canadians uh, drink groundwater, and that's a minority. In many countries, it's larger than this. In Europe, is 70%, and the US is 45%, etc. So Canadian groundwater users are those people that appreciate the value of groundwater in its greater, uh, in its greater realm than our political minority. Also, we live up in the country, and so we're dispersed. The problems are dispersed and they don't get political attention very often. And I've been quoting and saying, saying it, and I stand by it, but basically the biggest problem to, to protecting groundwater in the province of Ontario is the Ministry of the Environment. Now, this isn't a political statement. I've made it basically for the last 20 years. Governments come and go, and it doesn't change. And I think one of the good things about meetings like this, which is really grassroots, is you have some chance to try and influence that. So, in this talk, um, I'm going to give you a flavor with a bunch of slides, etc., of what groundwater contamination is all about. And then for the last few minutes, I'll mention our research grant. That I've now been granted a month ago, $30,000 a year for five years from the Canadian government. Now, in my realm, that's a very small amount of money, but my colleagues tell me I shouldn't complain. That given the circumstances and given my stage of life and given many other things, we should be grateful for it. And I think the good news is that this $30,000 per year will kick off other things and it can go uh, a long way. And in the last few minutes, I'll mention an electronic book that I'm reading to basically bring groundwater information to all levels of people across the globe so that you can do basically franchise. I'll mention that right at the end. But in the meantime, I'll just show you a whole bunch of slides here to give you the flavor of, of uh, groundwater contamination. Okay. That's the wrong button, I think. So I'm from, uh, I was at Waterloo for 34 years as a professor, and I had a big groundwater group uh, until recently. And now I'm at the University of Guelph, basically working in a, a, a very prestigious, internationally renowned groundwater group led by my colleague, Dr. Beth Parker. And she was my grad student at uh, Waterloo, and now I'm her, her uh, postdoc, if you do it that way. Um, anyway, I just wanted to mention that. So, if I say if I say that anything's going to happen here, it, it's not going to happen because of me. It's going to happen because of Dr. Parker's research group. She has the money. She has the technicians, and, and she will lead the way. I'm kind of the cheerleader, and will arrange all of this. And uh, the unique thing about the work that I did at Waterloo for so many years, and the work that she's doing is it's field focused, which means that we go out into the field with our students and we drill holes. And we take samples from the holes and we put wells in the holes, but we won't just put wells in the holes, we put very, very uh, specific research devices in the boreholes so we can learn a lot more than you would learn from just putting them on a well. And I'll end up talking about that here at the end. So it's a field focused group with technicians and grad students and 
uh, and um, people who know how to go out in the field and get things done. And you could say, well, what's the big deal? This is very rare in academia. The professors actually go out in the field on real holes uh, and involve students actually in the real world. And you say, well, what's wrong with universities if they're not engaged in the real world? It's very expensive to be involved in the real world. You have to get money for drilling, pipes, and all of this stuff. And so basically, Dr. Tarkin's research budget is, is about $4 million a year. And that's about $3.5 million more money than any other professor has in Canada for doing all the research. And you might think she's rolling dough, uh, but she isn't because this work is so damn expensive. It can cost $100,000, for example, to just go to one blowhole and do a whole bunch of things in it. All right. Now, there's a global water price crisis, uh, and there are many books coming out on this, where a journalist will travel around the world and read stuff and basically write a view of, of this crisis we have. Whether it's South Africa and Cape Town running out of water, or whether it's Hanging Township here, where you're fighting uh, another, or in this area where you're fighting another landfill, or whatever. Um, and then the current global population is uh, 7.4 billion, and it's going to go to 11 or 12. Can you know, imagine that? And so what are the rest of the people who are going to join this society of ours on this global immigrant? They're almost all going to have to use groundwater. So countries that are busy wasting, polluting, and mismanaging groundwater are going to start standing out more and more in the global community. Oh, and I might make, mention uh, Jacob's uh, talk, because I hear about this as I travel around the world. Um, and a few years ago, I didn't even know anything about palm oil. So do look at the packaging, and look at all your, your package fees. Look at the ingredients. You find palm oil in almost everything. And when you use that package, that basically means you're contributing to the cutting down of the rainforest, mostly in Indonesia and uh, Malaysia, a very important topic that you don't hear very much because it's all kind of traveling below the radar screen. All right, so groundwater is 96% of all fresh water, and it really is the heart of the, of the global water crisis. So there's lots of parts of the global water uh, problem, uh, groundwater, uh, and I'll address, I'll address um, contamination. But there's pumping in the wrong areas, there's pumping too much, there's pumping too little, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It all it all weaves together. And the problem with polluting our groundwater, of course, is once we pollute it to a certain point, it becomes unavailable. So I'm kind of thinking of all sorts of, of water resources, but if we pollute the water resources we have, then the available water we have is actually renewable, pure, so it's diminishing. And what I'll get to here at the end is pristine groundwater is extremely rare. So what is pristine groundwater? Which is one of my favorite research topics. Um, pristine groundwater is groundwater that doesn't have any chemicals from human activity. So when you around here again seem to have lots of it. And I'll get to that a little bit later on. So groundwater contamination is a global problem that's worth me with no no end in sight. Uh, and, and if you go into Wikipedia or whatnot, you'll see a definition of something called a wicked problem. A wicked problem I think came out of the computer industry when they get things that they just can't can't solve. Uh, and this is a, a definition of a wicked problem. And groundwater contamination and certainly fits this definition. Groundwater contamination is a wicked problem. So why are we in Ontario so backward? Is it because our, cons our, our politicians are, are, are poor union people? No, not at all. So we're backward basically in a way because the problem is so difficult to, uh, to deal with. It, it's going to take many elements to fit together to get uh, groundwater functioning properly. All right, so what's, what's groundwater? Well, if you dig a hole anywhere with a post-hole auger, if you're patient, if you just keep augering, at some point then you'll see water forming in the hole. And then water will come, go up in the hole, and then you look, can look down in the hole, and that's the water table. About 30 or so years ago, I was an advisor making a movie about groundwater. Okay. Kids and I set off in the field and we went out with a cameraman and we dug a hole in the sand and we were down about seven or eight feet. And there was groundwater. So the kids had to learn that very early in age. So if you keep digging, you eventually hit it. It's there to be seen. So once you get below the water table, then you've got free water. And that means any, any depth below that, if you put a pipe or a well in the ground, then water will flow into it. Above the water table, you've got water, and that's soil water. 
but why would we be sold into a pipe? Okay, so the water table is a pretty straightforward concept. The water table is everywhere. So groundwater is everywhere, uh, and around here, if you dug a hole, then you'd find it in silt or clay or sand. And if you dug a hole around wealth in some areas, you'd find it in rock. So the rock has cracks, and that's where the groundwater flows, and silt and sand are grains, and the water flows between the grains. And um, I'd like to show these slides, whether they're uh, very relevant or not, but a number of years ago, I had a very interesting trip out on the Gobi Desert with a group of Chinese Oriental scientists, and say, why would we be driving out in the Gobi Desert? They were driving out in the Gobi Desert because they wanted to show me the site at which they proposed to bury their high-level nuclear waste. So I think around here, you've heard, you know, that, that, that uh, we will be uh, burying waste and, uh, on the Bruce Peninsula, etc. and in China, they're looking for a place, too. So China now builds more nuclear reactors than any country in the world, and they will not, in the too distant future, then, have more high-level radioactive waste disposed of uh, in the world. Is nuclear power a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I don't want to debate that, but if we want to avoid climate change, then nuclear power is relatively clean. So, here's my trip out in the Gobi Desert with this group of Chinese engineers, and there you can see in the upper left the, the, the old SUV vehicle, and the lower right, we're driving along, and somebody says, there's a well. I go one day out driving in the Gobi Desert, and there's nothing at all, and then somebody says, there's a well. Really? And you get out then, and you look down the well, and about, uh, about a couple of meters down, there's the water table. Can't quite see it in the slide, but it's, it's right down there. And you say, well, what's, what's a hand dug well doing out in the middle of the Gobi Desert? Well, for, for uh, centuries or longer, there have been nomads. Okay, and nomads then live in the desert. And you say, how do they live in the desert? Well, it rains every once in a while, and when it does rain, there's a little bit of grass, and then they can actually use that for their, for their sheep and goats. In the old days, they traveled around with camels, and now they travel around with little tractors, and that's their, uh, that's their little collapsible tent. <coughs> the point here being that groundwater is everywhere, and wherever groundwater is, it's moving. So it's going from some place where it's into the ground to some place else. The Chinese are trying to figure out, like we are trying to figure out, if we have a deep geological repository there in granite in the middle of the Gobi Desert, would that be a safe place to put? Would that be a safe place to put the waste to keep it safe for many thousands of years? So we go down then, and we see we have the water table, and the water table is always sloping. So it, unless you're in a, in a very strange lake desert area with no topography and whatnot, the water table has a slope on it, and that's just like the slope on a road. Groundwater flows from a point that's high in the slope to a point that's, low, that's lower in the slope. The water doesn't flow from uh, high pressure to low pressure, that's a different issue. It flows from one water level to another water level, not from high pressure to low pressure. Uh, and so most, in, in this part of the world then, almost all of our streams and rivers and lakes are receiving groundwater. So on the left here, we see a river or a lake and there's infiltration. So if we pollute groundwater and if it doesn't end up in our wells, uh, then it's going to end up somewhere else. Like it eventually ends up somewhere else. And a lot of the pollutants we're putting into groundwater then eventually move along, and then they eventually end up discharging to the local stream, the <coughs> lake, etc. Now, the first discovery of groundwater contamination was made by a medical doctor in London, the name of John Snow. And before the, you know, before 1854, People had no idea why tens and hundreds of thousands of people would basically die whenever a plague uh, went through Europe or whatnot. So that was the main population and the main factor back then, the word plagues. And so John Snow then figured out that the cholera plague in London at that time was transmitted uh, by, the, by the microbes then traveling through the ground uh, into a, a, a bad hand dug well. Before that, people had no idea. And groundwater science then has been developing uh, mostly in the last 50 years after this discovery. And then the, uh, the person who really brought the awareness of the environment to all of us was Rachel Carson, an American biologist who wrote this amazing book. And she's the hero of all environmental writers. And she got all sorts of criticism at the time. People said she was anti-progress and anti-industry and didn't know what she was talking about. But in essence, she was a wonderful, a worldwide hero uh, to bring to us 
really the message that in a modern society based on new chemicals and all of the modern things that we need to exist in a normal way, that there's a downside to that. The downside that relates to the fact that we're living out of harmony with nature. If we take it too far, which we have. So groundwater had, uh, so pristine groundwater. Groundwater has no detectable chemicals of human, animal, agriculture, or industrial origins. Like no anthropogenic uh, chemicals. So there's very little of that left in North America and in almost parts of the world. Maybe in some deserts and maybe in some places where there's not much human habitation. And so why is that? It's because aquifers are composed of sand or gravel, uh, and water then flows, and this is for an American audience, but water flows between half a feet to half a foot to three feet per day. And if it's fractured rock, like the rock that's below us here after you drill through the overburden, then the velocities are much higher. So groundwater is moving along, and you'd say, oh, well, groundwater moves slowly compared to water flowing from rivers and lakes, and that's true. But if you multiply a foot per day or 10 feet per day by decades, then in fact you can bring chemicals basically everywhere. You can bring chemicals nearly everywhere based on these velocities if the chemicals aren't disappearing, if they're, if they're persistent, and if they're mobile. Now we'd be all dead long ago by drinking groundwater if in fact most of the chemicals that we produce in society are mobile uh, and are persistent. So it's a very small number of chemicals that are mobile and persistent. So those are the ones we have to pay attention to. Uh, so pristine groundwater is rare for the reasons I indicated. That, that uh, over decades then things can, can invade just about all, all parts of the subsurface world. Now back back in the uh, when I I started to I started to study groundwater contamination in 1967. I arrived back from a postdoc in France as a young professor at the University of Manitoba. I had gone to the University in Saskatchewan, I grew up in Ottawa. But I ended up in Manitoba, and I was going to study something completely different than groundwater contamination. And then a young woman walked into my office, a second year civil engineer, and she said, Dr. Cherry, you need to study radioactivity in groundwater. I said, well, I'm not interested in that, and I don't know anybody who is. And she said, well, I spent the summer at the White Shell Nuclear Research Establishment, where they were developing experimental reactors. And she rooted around and actually had a choice of, of doing something useful as a summer student. And she went out to where they were burying some of the radioactive waste, and she had some holes drilled, and she put wells in the holes, and she found that tritium, radioactive water, was moving from some of these pits. And then the light bulbs went on. People at this plant site had no idea they assumed that they were burying the radioactive material in, in clay that was impervious. As it turns out, the clay had cracks in it. So this young woman, all on her own, discovered a big issue. But she had to go back to school. So she said, Dr. Cherry, I think you need to get out there and bring your expertise, because you're the only, red, you're the only person with a PhD in groundwater within a thousand miles, um, out, to this, out to this nuclear plant site. And I explained, but, but uh, that's not a research area. I can't build a career on that. But she shamed me into it. Uh, and, and, and that's what I was basically going on to do too. And she explained it would be my ethical responsibility to go to and study something that's relevant. Oh, study something that's relevant. That can be a new idea for a professor. Okay, so I did a number of things and I arrived at the University of Waterloo in 1971. And then we began to realize that organic contaminants, you know, that are gasoline and chlorinated salts, that organic contaminants are a big deal. Uh, and in order just to, at the very simplest level, to look at how contaminants behave in groundwater, we went out to Canadian Forces Base Borden. And I knew the commander of the base out there because I'd studied the landfill for the, the Canadian Forces Base Borden for the federal government. So I went out there and I said, we want to pump some chemicals into your aquifer so we can see how they behave. And, and that's gone on now for many decades with others taking over. So what are we doing? This is a map. So we're looking down on a map, and over on the left, we can see a bunch of white dots, or white dots, and that's where we're pumping in a salt, a chloride and a, a bromide salt, and a few other chemicals that, that we need to talk about here. And it's that, so we pump it in for a few days, and then it moves as a blob. Okay, it just moves along as a blob. And this is just a simple experiment so that we can convince ourselves that we know what we're doing in a very simple situation. But to, to, to keep track of where this little blob is going, then we have to have lots of sampling points. So for example, if you're a company and you've got a landfill or you've got a gravel pit, and you want to then basically not find any of the contaminants moving from it, what you do 
If you put in a bunch of wells, they're either at the wrong location or they're not enough of them. Okay, so most monitoring that goes on in the province of Ontario and just about everywhere else around the globe, there aren't enough data points to actually decide whether the contaminants are moving or not. So in this thing, because this is a research project, then we've got lots of data points. So here we are pumping in uh, these chemicals uh, into the aquifer down at a depth of about uh, five or six meters. And this experiment was done at Waterloo and, and uh, Stanford University and plenty of Canada and USC, et etc. It's a big deal in this Europe. Oh, and it's the Borden sand. And Borden got the sand there from the Coast Coast Borden, which is a very nice beach sand. The beach sand was laid down when the glaciers were here. So hydrogeologically speaking, it's a very nice um, non-complicated sand. So if you understand what happens in this sand, maybe you've got some hope of understanding the more complicated sites. All right. So here you can see all these black pipes sticking out of the ground. And each one of those black pipes has a, has a, has a, has a piece of PVC in the ground with about a dozen little uh, tubes attached to it. So each one of these pipes is not a well, it's a monitoring <coughs> system. It's a monitoring system so you can sample at 10 or 12 different depths because you don't know where the contaminants are. So you have to sample all sorts of depths to find them. If you just put it in a normal well, you likely wouldn't find them. And here's one of my colleagues of the past, Dr. Emil Friend, and he he's holding up one of these PVC uh, pipes with a bunch of little tubes attached to it. And each tube then has, has some holes in the bottom with a, with a little bit of netting around it. So each one of these tubes is a miniature well. And the type of research that we want to do here in the Indel area starting, starting in the summer, then we want to have pipes in the ground with lots of tubes. So we find out exactly what's happening around here. All right, and this doesn't cost much. Well, it doesn't cost much to do this in the Borden Act, but it's going to cost a little bit of money to do it here for reasons that I'll get to. And so there's the blob at day one, and then after a year and a half, there's the blob. So it's not much thicker, but we're looking now in cross sections. So this is a slice. A slice through the, the packing of, of this uh, blob, which is salt, salty blob. And the blob moves along about one of the major points here, and one of the surprises for the scientific community is that the blob, the, the blob, if we call it that, isn't, isn't mixing very much. It's not diluting very much. So it's not assimilating very much. In other words, this blog would have gone on for years if we let it go on for years. And this was in 1982. Uh, we did another experiment in 79, so in 82, 83. We learned that this blog is hardly mixing at all. In other words, it's hardly disappearing at all. And that was big news. It helped make me, a, make me famous. We published this in all sorts of journals. And you could say, well, how is such a simple thing Make a sign to help make a sign this famous. It's because it's a simple thing, and people thought otherwise. They thought that the blob would actually mix and disappear. And there's great consequences that we'll get to here in a moment. All right. And here's another experiment. Uh, it's kind of the same, but in this one, we don't bury a blob. We bury, we bury some, uh, some chlorinated organic chemicals uh, that are very common, that they've been used in dry cleaners and in machine shops and all that. So we're Buy some of this toxic chemical material. It's, it's like an oil, but it's heavier than water. And we're going to carefully bury it in the ground, and then we're going to watch it move just to see what happens to it. And you can say, well, am I in the business of polluting perfectly good aquifers? No, not really, unless I have to. Um, and, and this particular aquifer is already polluted at a, at, a, at, a, at a different depth. But we got permission to do these experiments from the Canadian forces because, in fact, after we do them, we pump the stuff out, et cetera, et cetera. So this is for the sake of science. So there on the left, we have something called a bean apple source. And bean apple is a dense, non aqueous based liquid. It's a heavy liquid. And we put it into the sand. We mixed it into the sand. It's not floating. It's just mixed, like oil mixing the sand. And it sits there. And then the groundwater flows through it, and it creates that plume after 323 days. And each one of those black dots then is a sampling plume. So you can see the high density of these dots we need, we need to have if we're actually going to find what happened to this particular chemical. So hundreds and thousands of sampling points, and many grad students and technicians then are out there doing this to keep track of this little chemical blob that we planted uh, in the Borden sand not far from Nelson. And this is big league international science being done then in the early 80s, uh, being done because people hadn't done it before. And we learned amazing things from it. All right, now getting closer to home, many of you in this 
room probably have a septic system. I won't ask you to put up your hands. I have one. Uh, and if you have a septic system, then you're engaged in basically polluting groundwater. Um, now, if all goes well, you're not polluting groundwater very much. And if all goes well, then it will, will be no consequences to it. So now I'll tell you about septic systems. So in 1984, I was giving a talk at a big conference in Philadelphia, and a person came out of the audience, and I wasn't talking about septic systems, I was talking about something else. And they said, well, Dr. Cherry, you know, we're wondering what septic systems do, and we're wondering if you would down to a search program, basically go look at what a septic system does. And I looked at the literature, and I'm thinking, like, man, people don't know anything about septic systems. I said, hundreds of thousands and millions of septic systems across the country, they hardly know anything about what they do. And such is the fruit of the discovery of the ignorance that we have in, in ground science. So the company was Procter & Gamble, and what they wanted to know then was what would, would, would their latest version of Tide cause any impacts on groundwater? Of course, they want to know that because if their version of Tide then caused groundwater contamination, then they would be very vulnerable. Okay, and in fact, they funded this research for 25 years, and we found a family on a nice sandy deposit outside of Guelph that contained the Tide experimental family. So each time that Rod Creek Gamble produced some new Tide, it was brought to the family, and they would use it, and then we would look to see what we could see in the groundwater. And basically, we would never see anything that came from Tide, and that was the whole point. But we'd see all the other stuff. All right. And I have a septic system, not that I know much about it. Um, so a septic system, I, I was going, you know, when you hired the guy to come in and clean it up, then you have to ask a few questions in front of everybody about your septic system. So your, your, your waste goes into a tank, and it stays there for a while, and the bacteria work on it, and they degrade, degrade much of the organic matter, so they're improving quality. And from there it goes out into the drain pipes, and they're, they're a meter or so below ground surface. And from there then, from the drain pipes, when you flush the toilet, eventually that stuff then goes out and infiltrates through the, to the Vado zone. So what's the Vado zone? The Vado zone is the zone above the water table. Okay, and, and this is all very engineering designs and whatnot. So, forth. so the, the, the nitrogen and the organic matter then dribbles through the, the Vado zone, and there it, it gets into contact with oxygen. So the microbes and the oxygen then further purify the water. So a properly functioning septic system then purifies everything to some degree. It converts all your nitrogen to nitrate. Okay, and nitrate now is the most important contaminant in the world, mostly from agricultural fertilizer. So the purpose of a properly functioning septic system is to convert all the nitrogen into nitrate so it goes in the groundwater. And so if it's not a properly functioning septic system, it won't be contaminating the groundwater with nitrate, it will be doing other things that are even worse. All right. And so here are the tiles and whatnot, and you know, for those of you that have taken a bit of chemistry, there are reactions that go here. And, and so if all goes well, when the, when the water hits the groundwater table then, the main contaminant is nitrate. The main contaminant used to be nitrate, and now it's a bunch of other things possibly, and I'll get to that in a moment. All right, so properly functioning system does as I told you then, so how is it then that we have millions and millions of septic systems across the country, out in the suburbs, so on and so forth? And the problem here isn't out in the country. It's not out here in the country where there's only one house on many acres. The problem with septic systems is when you have a whole suburbs, and you've got one well, one septic system, basically every half acre. Okay, well, basically that's that's kind of sanity. That's that's insanity in, in a way, with engineering having gone wrong. So what were the engineers thinking who basically designed septic systems and got governments to agree that septic systems are the way that you develop your suburbs? They were thinking that when all this waste went into the ground, it would disappear. It would disappear by assimilation. Oh, now this septic system, and each one of those dots is one of these multi-level devices, and what we found with this septic system is hardly any attenuation at all to the chloride and to the nitrate and a few other things. The septic system produces a sand and gravel, a long, skinny plume. And that long, skinny plume can go for as much as a kilometer long. If you can imagine a, set, a suburb, everybody's got a well, everybody's got a septic system, and whatnot, and each septic system producing a long, skinny plume if you're on sand. Okay. The good news, well, it's not good news, but you're, at least you're not drinking your own sewage. You're drinking, you're drinking your neighbor's sewage. And, uh, and, and there's some probability then, if you're in the suburb, that, that these long skinny plumes will be missing your well. All right, now, uh, when I was in uh, Baltimore uh, a week ago, I, I gave a talk, I, I 
kind of a good talk, and just the, the, the theme of the talk was, was basically ignorance um, uh, and, and my own participation in ignorance. Like we're all participating in ignorance a fair amount of the time, and we're trying to decide, and we're trying to learn enough so we're not ignorant and doing a bunch of harm. Uh, so, so I was a grad student at the University of Illinois in 1964 to 66, and I was sitting in a grad class, probably the only two hours that I heard in my entire university education on groundwater contamination. Like three degrees, that's one of the best universities. I only heard two, two hours in groundwater contamination. That's because nobody thought it was an issue. And so when I did get my two hour dose of, of uh, university education on groundwater contamination, I, I was told that there was a groundwater contamination problem in the late 1950s, but this problem had been solved. So basically what was happening in the late 1950s that caused the public furor. Basically when people were turning on their taps, they were getting foam. Like tens of thousands of people were turning on their taps, you know, in Long Island, Long Island, and the foam was coming up. So in the United States they'd build these massive suburbs, you know, not wanting to raise taxes and pay for sewers and all that stuff. So everybody would be on a private well uh, and on a septic system. Um, so one Long Island County, look at that. Etc. So how do you solve that problem? You basically get the companies producing uh, uh, producing detergents to change the formula. And this is regarded as a huge success. A huge success and the problem went away. I was sitting there in class and I was sitting there as a dummy, you know, thinking that everything that comes at you actually makes some sense. The professor didn't point out that basically having having a foaming agent in, in going into your septic system is probably the best thing you want. Because it means then that somebody who turns on their tap <laughs> realizes they've got contamination. Now, I didn't get this straight out, straight out of my own mind until, until the 80s when we began to do research on this. And everybody had forgotten about it. Everybody had forgotten then that when they're turning on their taps, they're basically uh, pulling, when their well is functioning, they're pulling in water from, uh, from somebody, generally somebody else's septic system. All right. So, what do we find now? The people who go out and do this, my colleagues at Water at, at Guelph have done some of it, and other people around the world. When you actually look at what's in your well water, um, in areas where there are a lot of septic systems, what do you find? Well, you find little, very small level doses of, of your or your neighbor's pharmaceuticals. Um, Tylenol, and you name it, just low doses. So I'm not, I'm not in any way arguing here that there's any harm with drinking water with low doses of Tylenol, etc. It's just that that's what's happening. So now across the US and Europe, when people sample groundwater, quite often they're finding artificial sweeteners. <coughs> For example, certain types of coke and whatnot and so forth have sweeteners. So why are these showing up? So they're showing up because groundwater flows along and in a period of 10 or 20 years it gets there. Why are these, com these chemicals showing up? They're showing up because they're mobile, they travel over the water, and they go to grave. So it's interesting. Now, of all the pharmaceuticals, like we've got thousands and thousands of pharmaceuticals we're using, only a few are showing up. So that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is some are showing up uh, in the pharmaceutical industry and in the food industry and more. All right. So how did all this sort of craziness get going where people thought you could just put things in the groundwater uh, and they would kind of disappear? And one of the reasons why this, this got going was people thought the groundwater would mix. They thought it was like a river. Of all towns and cities, you have a light bulb where your treated sewage, in some cases untreated sewage, is going into a river. Okay? And, and then you build a sewage treatment plant, that's so you can get it so that the degree of pollution isn't too high. And that's because you're depending on the river then to assimilate, to take care of it. The problem with groundwater is it doesn't do a very good job of assimilation, but it does a good job of taking care of it. In many cases. Okay, so we have assimilation capacity. Which, which in essence is what engineers have been, have been counting on. Like we put, we, put, uh, we put gas into the atmosphere and it doesn't kill us and we have regulations so we control it. We allow sewage to go into rivers and lakes and we control it and it's assimilated and all that works, we're not dying. Okay, but if it's up to groundwater, the question is then well, how does assimilation capacity work? When does it protect us? Etc. So um, groundwater has a large capacity, but not enough when we excessively overload the system. So if we have too many septic systems, or too many gas stations, or, or too much uh, agriculture fertilization and pesticides and whatnot, if we overload it, then we're going to have the chemicals showing up. All right, so pristine groundwater is rare. Um, 
So the old groundwater being pumped today has these chemicals, and several, several decades of modern agriculture and industry then is enough then to get these mobile, uh, these mobile uh, long-lasting chemicals pretty well everywhere. Um, and you can say, well, okay, what does this mean? Is there a problem? Well, in most cities and towns, particularly towns and, and people in private wells, you have no idea where there's a problem. Because in fact, you're not getting analyses done until you know what's in the water. I already know what's in the water in my well. I just kind of look around, I think it's okay, and every once in a while my wife says, jump in with the water in the well, and I say, yeah, well, if I'm better about it, I'm really busy. Um, but, but I think we're okay given the locations and whatnot. So in fact, governments aren't providing the services for those of you who are in private wells to get analyses done and tell you very much. Now you can get analyses done on your private well water, which is what I should do. Um, if you know the right thing to ask for, and if you know how to sample correctly, etc. But who amongst the lay public, and even amongst the non-lay public, is going to know enough then to know how to sample, when to sample, and what to, what to analyze for? So basically, governments across the globe, and particularly in Canada, have abandoned everybody who's on a private well. Governments have decided that's your business, you can protect your health, etc. And you get no advice out of them. Maybe you go to a website, with Health Canada and whatnot, they might tell you something, but they're not really into it. All right. Now, landfills, uh, landfills, then they all leak. The old landfills in my early days, they were nothing more than a, a pit dug in the ground. And if you did it at the right location, you put it in your garbage, and then it would form a plume. And the assumption back then was that the plume uh, wouldn't go very far. Uh, so we assumed that it would be assimilated. And that's how I started part of my career, studying the landfill plume on Canadian ports of base clothing, which is a lovely, lovely plume to study. Lovely means it's lovely to read, you can publish scientific papers on it, you can understand it, you can send sand, etc. That's what lovely means to a well of contamination, actually. And in addition to not doing any harm. So plumes have, uh, so anytime you dig a pit in the ground and you put in some waste, or you pour some waste onto the ground and whatnot, it's going to form a plume. It's going to form a plume in our climate because we've got lots of wells, lots of rain. Uh, and it's not part of the water table. So every activity that's going on around here, whether it's a little machine shop or a dry cleaner or whatever, or if, it, or, if, or if it's a farmer basically mixing their pesticides, etc., all of those locations are groundwater contamination locations. Uh, so here at the Borden Landfill, this goes back to the mid to late 70s, we put in a bunch of wells. For the first time anyone in first time anyone anywhere in the world had properly ma ma monitored a contaminant flowing from a landfill. So what did people do before we did? They put in a few wells and get a few data points and plot it up and say things are okay. This plume isn't doing any harm, as it turns out, it's not a toxic plume, etc. But at least we know exactly what it's like by putting lots of tubes in the ground and not just a bunch of just normal wells. Alright. And we found a very nice plume of mostly salt. There's hardly anything harmful in this plume, as it turns out, but you wouldn't want to drink it. So when you analyze it for all the chemicals that we look for, this plume is relatively harmless compared to the big city lines or whatever. And it travels along at a rate of the front, moves forward at a rate of about 10 centimeters a year. Um, and we contoured it and we published it, etc., etc., and then we mathematically modeled it. I guess the point here is that the We've studied groundwater contamination in many cases by putting chemicals into the ground and watching them move. And then we scale it up and we go to, to sites all across North America where we study particular plumes from particular industries. So at least we can say we've got one plume from one type of industry that we understand well. And we've studied probably four or five plumes from correct industries now. So do dry cleaners cause toxic chemicals to go to the ground? Every dry cleaner on the face of the earth before the regulations came in lately, and they're probably not enforced, causes a plume of toxic chemicals. So the state of Florida, for example, has a super fund where they put a tax on dry cleaning. And this fund isn't a big one, it's a small one. And their job then is to find and clean up all the dry cleaning plumes in the state of Florida. And Florida's nothing but a pile of sand with a water table that's down only a meter or two. So every dry cleaner in the state of Florida, until recently, if they, until recently, if they happen to be careful, then has a little plume moving along in the subsurface world. Right. Okay, so we've got lots of sources of contamination, road salt. So what's the biggest threat to groundwater quality in the province of Ontario? It's road salt. There's cities like Waterloo and Kitchener and Cambridge and Guelph, where if you look at the graph of salt, it's getting up to the taste level. So what's the solution on that? 
the social lab is that maybe we shouldn't put so much salt on the globe. At the University of Guelph some days, I don't know whether it snowed or whether they've just been, been uh, over, over, over applying salt. So why do people do that? Like, why are we crazy? We do that because of the insurance industry doesn't want to pay for Canadians who are driving too fast, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Like in, in Western Canada, they can't use salt because it's too cold. They have to use, they have to use sand, et cetera. So when it comes to craziness in terms of contaminating groundwater in Canada, we kind of leave the world with salt. Uh, now, nitrate, nitrate levels are climbing across the globe, just dramatically. It's a little discussed a problem. It's a little discussed, ignored, but huge problem. This guy's probably likely causing a lot of health problems. A little discussed, ignored, but huge. Why? It's because basically it's got to do with the food. It's got to do with how we farm. It's got to do with modern agriculture. All of which is craziness in many cases in the context of groundwater contamination. All right. Uh, and, and dry cleaners, machine shops, repair shops, welding shops. Wherever these little activities have gone on in the past, there will be a plume of toxic chemicals moving along. Not that the plume is a problem, I'm just saying that that's the world we have to envision. Okay, so when you pump your well, uh, what happens? Well, the water table, or the water level draws down to make a cone, okay? Uh, it, it's a cone, and then the water from within that cone is drawn into the well. So if you only pump your well intermittently and whatnot, you only make a cone occasionally. If you're a town and so forth, then you make a cone all the time. So the landscape, the subsurface landscape, which you can envision, down here on the ground, with the water moving along, has these hundreds and thousands of little plumes kind of moving along, just moving along, of certain chemicals. And then we've got hundreds and hundreds of wells captured. Uh, and then we've got bigger wells and bigger cities captured, et cetera. So You've got plume, you've got capture. Now when the well captures the contamination, it does mix them. So in, in almost all cases, the concentrations go down to a lower level. And what does the government tell you about the lower level? They say, don't worry, it meets our standards. Oh, meets our standards. So where did the standards came from? Where did the nitrate standard come from? It came from seven years ago, and people didn't know what they were doing. So most governments around the world say that the standard for nitrate should be lower. But nobody stopped in here to do it. If you change it from 10 milligrams per year to 1 milligram per year, all sorts of wells, municipal wells across the countryside, are going to be illegal. Okay? They're going to have to treat the water. Well, of course we treat, we treat drinking water all the time. But treating it for nitrate and some of these other chemicals, that's expensive. So it's got to do with money, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So do we know how harmful nitrate is on human health? Do we know how harmful it is on, say, fetuses or, uh, or young mothers or whatnot? The answer is... People are looking at it, there's reasons to worry, but, but that's not an area where governments are going to basically tell you what's going on. All right, well, so we have many wells, we've got many little captures. All right. Okay, so Elmville is scientifically interesting to people like me uh, for a number of reasons, but the primary one is that you have this amazing, pristine water. When I was told about it, I didn't believe it, and I heard about it from Bill Shoddick, who's an amazing person, and we were really lucky to have him living in the community. That's how I got here, and that's how a bunch of other top rank scientists are going to get here to collaborate with Bill uh, on, on this amazing world that he's discovered. So, this pristine water that's coming out of the ground here, and it almost brings me to tears to see it come out of the ground and then kind of be wasted, but, but nevertheless, um, that's probably okay. Um, once we figure all this out. Like, if all this water that's gushing out of the ground here down the road, is that wasting this marvelous pristine water? I'm not sure that it's wasting. It depends on where it's going and how it all adds up. And it depends on how it's being formed. But this pristine water you have may, in fact, be once only. Like, it may be a runoff. It, it may be your geological gift. It may not be here 100 years from now. So one of the reasons why I'm here with my colleagues to study this is this is First of all, scientifically, it's very interesting, and I think very important. Like we shouldn't go wasting and polluting and gravel pit and all that stuff uh, when there's this amazing water up here. So the water might be <laughs> water. Okay, so I applied, I worked very hard this fall to apply for my last research grant and insert the National Research and National Scientific and Engineering Research Council. Okay, and they're the organization that grants money to professors. Um, and you can apply every five years, and I've been doing that for every five years, and I did that this fall. 
Every five years, they make it more and more bureaucratic to the point where it's almost mind boggling how much I have to write down. I had to convince everybody that I wasn't an idiot, first of all. Many, many pages explaining why you're not an idiot and why the government should give you some money. And after you get through all of that, then you write some other stuff down. And, and so I was granted here, which is a relatively small amount of money, and my colleagues say that I, I should be happy. Uh, we can make it go a long way. All right. Um, what is the plan for spending this money? Well, we're developing a plan. Bill and I and Beth and others are talking about it, but the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to Bill's special spot on this farm where he's installed very special wells. Very special wells that can be sampled with no indications of uh, human stuff off the pipe or anything. And then the Ontario Geological Survey has, has done a geological hole there. And we'll go beside all of that and we'll put in a new type of device. A device where you learn about what's happening at all the different levels. And the only reason we can afford to do this is Jamie Archer, the, 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 the Canadian water well drilling, then he's going to contribute most of his time to free. Okay, and usually that's where the money goes, goes to drill. Uh, and, and so that's the <laughs> So when I got my $30,000 a month, I thought, how am I going to do that? It's going to drill what, what, half a well in the ground? Um, uh, but with Jamie's offer, and he's done this before with Bill Shotty, and with other contributions, etc., the $30,000 will go a long way to get us going. All right. Uh, so the, the team here is Beth Parker, Guelph, and Bill Shotty, and Ian Clark. All world uh, level scientists. And, uh, uh, Ian Clark then is from a graduate from Waterloo of long ago. He's the world's premier, runs the world's premier lab on analyzing water for certain types of things to figure out the origin and age. So he's going to come to his lab and do free of charge analysis. Um, so we're going to get tens of thousands of dollars that worth of free work out of the tens of thousands for Ian Clark in this lab. Then the Alberta is going to do all these analyses. So right off the bat with a, with a very little small research grant. We're going to have really world class intervention coming in. <laughs> All of this came from me giving a talk in Kingston about two and a half years ago that Bill Shock attended. I was giving a talk, ranting about the interior ministry environment and so forth. Um, and uh, Ian introduced Bill to me, and, and, uh, and that led to me finding out what Bill does. And I wouldn't have known about Bill because he does research in another area. No, 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 no. So basically, you, know, you, get, you get out and you get some talks and you get connections. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful team. And, it, and it's all kind of Canadian. All right. So this is a, a cross-sectional diagram. And, and typically, you know, you can have an unconfined actor. That's your first sand. And then you can have a confined bed, and that might be a layer of clay. And then below that, you might have another aquifer, which you call confined, etc. So typically, in Ontario, and many other places, then you have sand and clay and sand and clay, and, and the, the clay beds are, are caps. They, they control the system. Uh, and, and the sand bed, those are the aquifers. So what's kind of amazing at Bill's, at Bill's location, he, he's got wells in, in, a, in, in an aquifer that's under a clay, and then he's got well, a well in an aquifer below the next clay, and they're both artesian, etc. So what's going to be interesting is figuring out just how is the, how is the water flowing? Like what is the geology? How is it flowing? Now, where does this pristine water come from? And why is it still there? So I've discovered pristine water before, um, but I've always discovered in clay deposits. So when you set the wind page and you drill into the clay, and you take water out of the clay. The water is 10,000 years old, but where did it come from? It came from where the glaciers were there. Okay, and my students and I have discovered pristine water in a number of other clay deposits in southern Ontario. So southern, southern Canada, in many cases, had these lakes sitting there, when the glaciers were leaving, and the lakes were mud, and the mud got laid down, so you end up with a thick clay deposit. Now, if the clay deposit is thicker than 10 or 20 or, 20 or 30 meters, then typically you find glacial water in the clay. So, pristine glacial water isn't unusual. Uh, it's unusual to find in action. What are you going to do with pristine water in the clay? You can't find it, you can't use it, it's just a scientific curiosity. But finding pristine water in sand and gravel beds, where you can actually pump it and where you've got artesian wells is quite amazing. So the question, the scientific question then is, is this, is this pristine water, um, is it glacial water? And if it's glacial water, then, then basically all this water that's, you know, those wells and whatnot, that's the, that's the last. 
um, if it's if it's water that's being purified because of the forest and the soil and all that stuff, then it's then it's re, then it's replenishable. Uh, and and it, it, I assumed it was glacial water, but when I got talking to Bill and Ian, and we talked about the evidence, there's no reason to assume that. And in fact, it could be a, an extra boat. Um, I should quit. All right. Oh, so what are we putting in the ground? Uh, we're going to put in a devices that we see on the right. Uh, and they're called multi-level monitoring systems. And a multi-level monitoring system, you drill your well, and you get your pipe, and you get your tubes, and you put it in the ground, and you can sample from 10 to 20 different depths. And the type of device we're going to put in the ground here is a new type of device developed at Glow, which we're now just getting the patent for. And it's nothing more than a bunch of PVC pipe uh, and tube, etc. Very simple to be manufactured in a relatively simple shop. The prices are really low, relatively speaking. So we won't have to buy commercial devices that cost a fortune. So we're continuing our to drilling and these low-cost devices will raise a long way. All right. Okay. And so I think at the end of the summer or whatnot, we're trying to have a meeting here. And, and the more we can get engagement from from local people, whether it's a high school school or those of you that own land or whatnot, the farther we'll go. And this will be the first time in Canada where I think our local community could rally around the project and really be involved in it. And I have one other project I'll mention. It's, it's somewhat relevant. So a couple of years ago, I started an initiative to produce an electronic textbook, an electronic encyclopedia on all things groundwater. And I'm well underway, and I've got 120 scientists from around the globe writing chapters. It's going to be free of charge, on the web, downloadable. You could say who gives a damn, but the point here is that we're trying to have many of these chapters written so that at least parts of them can be relatively understandable by the lay public. That's, that's a good idea in general, uh, but, but more importantly, when you, the lay public, are better educated, when your local gravel company or your local whatever tells you they've got a groundwater monitoring system and they hired experts to tell you that there's no harm, if you, the local public, become much more educated, you'll be able to ask the questions to show that they really don't know what they're talking about. That's one question. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, uh, John, for that. It's um, fascinating and uh, encouraging to know that you're coming to our community to do this work. Um, and I should mention, he's mentioned uh, Bill Sharnick, who uh, most of us around here know for all his uh, good work in the community, the, the Water Festival, the Elmdale Foundation. In fact, uh, Bill is, Bill's Elmdale Foundation is uh, sponsoring the um, public meeting, part of this meeting. And uh, it is a charitable organization, and it undertakes education and um, all sorts of other stuff, so if you have, uh, uh, he, he wanted me to mention that. So the next speaker is... Uh,